My name is Stephanie. I'm a hardware design engineer. I've been doing hardware design engineering since, uh, well, for the last 30 years, I suppose. I've tried to start many companies in the past. Uh, when you start your own companies, you know that you, you, you have to learn a lot of things. Um, and um, so along the way, I, I, I've learned to do mechanical uh, design and FPG design, which I started doing when I was in LA. It was back in 2000, 2010. So it's been a while. Although again, uh, most of my knowledge I've learned, uh, you know, over time on the heap, you know, from a lot of people, uh, you know, self-taught type of thing. So I don't use, uh, well, I'll talk about that later, but overall, you know, I've been doing a lot of electronic design for a long time. So I guess I should be in good position. I've done a lot of uh, video stuff. That's always been my thing. I just love pixels, the potentials of pixels. It's not like people like to, uh, some people like uh, telecommunications and packets and stuff. I find that stuff so boring. So um, basically today, what I wanted to do is in a nutshell, uh, introduce you to the whole concept of the whole VGA stuff, which is really the first part will be about getting into the uh, timings and the pixels and duck clocks and all the theory behind uh, the creation of an image. And then we'll get uh, the second part will be into going into Quartus, which is the software I'm, I'm most used to, and it's pretty easy to use. I'll, I didn't create anything in advance, so we'll just create everything from scratch. So if it's uh, something that might be good enough for people to start getting into uh, the FPGA design, I'm going to do it in Verilog, which is really close to, to C. So it should make uh, uh, the idea of people getting into it maybe uh, might be a little bit easier. Uh, so we're just going to focus on creating the signals we need to drive the display. And then at the end, I will go back into explaining how you would implement the rest to interface to memory and then get uh, pixels out for a video DAC or a DAC, uh, whatever video DAC you have in mind. Um, but at least you have the, the understanding, know how, how to go about the, the next step afterward, because I think within an hour, we cannot uh, you know, go through everything. There's two possibilities uh, I'm going to talk about at the end, which is really to, to implement the controller to drive some memory to do bitmap uh, display or a text display, which are two very different ways to go about uh, displaying information on the screen. Um, so uh, let's move on. So like I mentioned, the goals, uh, just understanding how video works, um, the different parts we need. Uh, I'll go into Quartus a little bit. I'm going to surf over a lot of things. I'm going to talk about a lot of things. I'll try to um, put a lot of F, uh, focus on things that are really important. Um, again, if, there's our, uh, if there are questions at the end, please come back to me. Uh, I mean, worst case, if you have more questions later, and you're really interested to do it, then you could come on Discord, on the Phoenix uh, Discord and ask me questions directly to answer your problems or whatever. I'm more than willing to help people uh, start doing Verilog and stuff like this. And usually when people get in, on board and do, doing it, then it becomes uh, a lot easier over time. The challenge of FPGA usually is not to get started or to get stuff compiled. The challenge is then when you're starting having very dense devices and when you start dealing with uh, you know, clock domain crossing and stuff like this, which is really the bulk of what makes a good FPG engineers. And after all this time, I'm still not even super comfortable doing all that kind of stuff, but I manage. Um, you develop some techniques over time. But um, so I'm, I was asking for people in the crowd, how many people are good or have touched FPGA. So maybe half or, you know, one third or whatever. Uh, well, not one half, but anyway. So I just want to let people know that since I've learned everything on my own, I kind of developed my own technique or own ways to implement the code. And for some who've been doing that forever, been to school, maybe it's not up to par to their understanding. And so I don't want to offend any knowledge, gods of knowledge or people that have a strong belief in how it should be written. You know, software people tend to be like that sometimes, but even within the software realm, software programmer realm, there's different technique or ways to write stuff. So uh, let's not you know, uh, wor worry ourselves with that kind of stuff, but I just wanted to say that 
in terms of writing Verilog, I'm doing it in a certain way. It might not be the perfect way, but I think it's it's better, it's easier to understand. And when it comes down to create a Verilog, or not a create a Verilog, but create a core to drive a VGA screen, uh, even in that uh, case, there's many ways to do it. I'm going to do it a certain way, and it might be good, might be bad, but at least it works. And that's the I think at the end of the goal, at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. And then we can make it better if we want, but the, the deal is really to make it work. Um, I expect people to not be, for the people who have not done any FPGA, to not have done any, uh, possibly not have any FPGA experience with quarters or anything like this. Um, so that's why I thought it would be a good idea to just, uh, you know, go from scratch. Again, I want to go quick with this. So I've learned a lot of things over the years. I've, I, I've, I'm doing things my own way. Like anybody who's learning their own thing on their own pace at their own time, they, they tend to go into a certain way of doing things. Today, I'm going to use Quartus 18.1. Um, it's the uh, software that is free. This is the uh, web edition. Silings call them the web edition. You just go on and tell you download it and register, download it, and you're good to go. Uh, I think they're probably at 21, 22 now. I stick to older version because they usually, uh, the more recent version usually don't um, cover the, the old parts. I usually, nowadays it's a good trend to use older parts because they're more available if you go in China. Uh, if you want to use the latest and greatest, it's very difficult. So there's no point to downloading anything more recent than 18.1, but you know, suit yourself. I will use Verilog today because it's simpler. It's it's like C, um, and um, like I was mentioning before, there's 20 ways to implement a video signal generator. So I'm going to be, you know, doing one. All right. So how does a display work? I'm sure everybody came across that kind of information, but let's assume you did not. Um, overall, within an image, there's a blanking period a vertical bank, uh, blanking period where the, you know, back in the day with the screen, uh, there was the electron, uh, you know, um, moving around the screen to display. Sometimes it was on, sometimes it was off. There was a time where the electron gun needed to be go back to the beginning and start, you know, uh, displaying the screen again. So all this stuff stayed even in this era of digital and everything. Um, so basically, the way on the left, I don't know if it's your left or your right, but on my left side, the white uh, drawing shows that the display time where the pixels are actually shown on the screen is what starts the frame. And then there's the blanking, the horizontal blanking, which is really the time where normally the, the electron gun would go back at the beginning and then start. There's a sync pulse um, that you know tells the system, hey, we're at the end, so let's start again. And there's the same thing for the, uh, the vertical time which in that instance, they put at the bottom. That configuration never made any sense like this, but anyway, so let's, uh, so don't want to spend too much time on this. My, uh, my mind always made, it made more sense to have the, over, the overall uh, presentation of the image display, uh, the other side, which is basically when, the, when you start at zero, zero at the top left corner, you're in the blanking area. And then you're going to stay in blanking. You're going to come across a V-sync, H-sync every every line, and then at some point after the 45th, uh, we'll we'll go through the timing after that. But at some point, the display, the the the, the display enable the blankings are both enable disable, and then the display starts, and then you can start outputting the data out for the video deck to see your pixels. So. Um, like I said, I'm going to stick to my presentation, but again, suit yourself. The concept is always the same. It's inverted, but um, yeah. So first step when you want to display an image is basically just uh, find out, okay, with an FPGA is really, okay, what are the timings? When the, the pixel needs to be on and off? When do I need to create the sync pulse, the vertical sync, the horizontal, the, uh, horizontal sync, and when the blanking needs to be on and off for the vertical time and for the horizontal time. Um, so I found this great uh, page. I'm sure some of you in the crowd knows about that page. It's called atinivga.com. That guy just put all the timing information for most of the old standards. And it's a great source of information for anybody who wants to do any video stuff. 
And so I really recommend it. I never found anything better than this. So moving on. So for us, we need to find out at first how many, um, how many pixels there is in line, how many lines there is in the image, including and excluding the blanking, and when specifically do we need to create the horizontal sync and the vertical sync. So we start with the duck clock. The duck clock is really the time that the pixel will stay on and then move on to the next pixel. So with the, six, the VGA 640 by 480, this is really what we're doing today, is at 60 frames per second, we're talking about a clock, a standard clock of a 25, 1.5 megahertz, which is about 40 nanoseconds. And during one frame, the, 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 the overall frame will last 800 pixel long for one line. And there will be four, uh, 525 lines overall. Uh, did I, oh, I, I forgot to put the information. Anyway, so 525 total lines which amongst those 20, 525 lines, there will be 480 lines that will, the, the pixel will be enabled and there will be uh, 45 lines that won't be. So that means that there's literally, well, there's in the design we are about to go through, there's three signals we'll have to create. Well, at the beginning, there will be four. The time will have to enable a signal that says, hey, we are during the uh, blanking time, the horizontal blanking, then there's a signal that says, that's gonna say, hey, we're during the vertical blanking. And then there will be a signal that says, hey, we have a horizontal sync to create, and then we'll have a vertical sync to create. So that means overall at, at first, we'll need to create four signals out of the 25 megahertz clock. And at the end, we're gonna combine the uh, vertical say the vertical blanking and the horizontal blanking together. So this is the, the signal that will tell our circuitry to display or not uh, any pixel at all or enable the counters or stuff like this. So that's basic, basically how we do this. The way, so in the FPG design, what we will do is separate, there'll, there'll be two separate sections. The first section will be the horizontal section. I don't know if I had to put it there. Yeah, in, in a nutshell, you'll have a pixel counter that will count the number of pixels during a line. And when at the end of the line, when you reach the 800, then you'll return to zero and start counting to zero to, zero to 799 again. And um, that will increment the line counter till the line counter reach 7525 or zero to 524. And then the whole cycle will start again. So here I, I created this flow with, which gives you an idea how we'll go about. So there's the main counter here, which is the pixel, pixel counter from zero to 799. And we're going to instantiate a comparator that says, hey, uh, between zero and 160, we're in the blanking period. So that means that we're gonna get one signal to go high. And then when we're higher than 160 or 160 and higher, we're gonna go back to zero. And we're gonna do the same thing for the sync, which is when the pixel counter becomes higher than 15, because the if I go back, the timing says that the blanking, if we look at the page here, the front port, which is really the just before the, the sync, um, you're gonna have 16 pixels before the sync will last 96 pixels. And then you have 48 pixels left over before you start the image. The same thing for the vertical, but instead of counting in pixels, we're gonna start counting in lines. So for 45 lines, I think 45 lines, will have to generate a uh, vertical blanking and during that vertical blanking, we'll have to create a sync, a V-sync that will last two lines, but before we have to wait 10 lines, and which means that we're gonna start at 10 and number 10, uh, line number 10, and we're gonna finish at line 13 or less than 13, which is 12. So, and then there will be 33 lines that nothing will happen, which by the way, is always a great time if you have a CPU, or you know any system that drives your memory, it's a, always that that this is a great time to transfer your data because you don't need to access your memory at the time. That's the best time 
well, basically the, only, the time you need to transfer your data is while during the blanking. But a vertical, vertical blanking lasts a long time. So it's great to, and it's very, the, the size of the time, it's very known. It's so it's very easy to implement. Um, I mean, the, the vertical horizontal blanking is known as well, but since it doesn't last that long, it's a little bit more tricky to manage when you have a lot of data to transfer. So personally, I usually use the vertical blanking and just transfer everything and then I just wait to, for it to come back. But anyway. I'm, you know, digressing here. So to come back to the pixel counter, we to create the sync. So like I said, so pixel will have to wait before the pixel counter uh, reach the 16. All right, so pixel counter, um, I'm sure you're getting the pictures. On the other side, uh, for the vertical sync, it's the same concept, but we're using lines, numbers instead of um, uh, pixels. So, um, same thing from zero to 45, we're just going to make sure V blanking is one. And for the vertical sync, we're just gonna manage, we're just gonna monitor the line counter to be between 10 and 12. And when it's reached that point, then it gets to one. All right. Uh, so at this point, uh, we'll go through a microglossary for Verilog uh, for references. So basically uh, when you're using Verilog, you need to create modules which is a block of circuit, a circuitry. And to um, start or to create a modules, usually you, dis you describe uh, the different types, which is three types, input, output, in, in and out in terms of direction. So these are the, the, the key words that we, we would use. We'll use them later. We want, want, we want to express uh, numbers. Um, try to remember you're very down in the logic chain. You're very at the bottom. So everything is always, you always have to specify the um, number of bits you want to use, um, and then you do a colon, semicolon, my English is, I don't remember this one, the apostrophe, uh, the letter B for the value, it's a binary, of course, it's zero and one, but then you always have to, if you say 16 at the beginning, it means the number of bits that's gonna follow. It's the same concept for X, it's H, uh, the number of bits that you want to implement the number in, um, it's more obvious with it's it's more obvious or less obvious, I guess, with decimals. So for the numbers, same thing. So you know, with the decimals, in that case, for for example, the four apostrophe d, it means I want to encode the number eleven in four bits. The, here, the same thing, one twenty-eight. I want to encode it in eight bits. So this is an error that we tend to do sometimes. You're going to say, hey, I want to put the number 256, and you say, hey, I'm going to use 8 bits, when in reality, 256 is really 9 bits, because 8 bits is 0 to 255. So you have to be careful, although I guess most uh, Verilog people use um, will use X and binary more. That's what I do. I rarely use decimal, um, just for comparison, stuff like that. It's more, it's easier to read. Um, to give you an example, how we create a module, usually you're going to say the word module, and then you're going to give a description name. Um, and it's always great to store the file, like the Verilog file you're going to create to have the same name. So it's a lot easier to track later. And this is one of the examples I was talking about before, where this is one way of doing things. I like to put everything on one line. Because in Verilog, you can usually what people do is that they say input the name of the net that comes in in the module. And then later, they're going to say, hey, this name, uh, like for example, I would say, hey, this is wire video clock in. And it's like you're redefining the thing to say, hey, that input is a wire. It's not a register, it's a wire, and so on and so forth. I hate that way of doing things because. If you want to find out if it's an input, not an input or an output, but if you want to know if it's a wire or it's a register, it's an output or an input, it's it's not as obvious. That's one of the reasons why I took the um, habit of always putting an underline. It's not a very long thing, it's a Stephanie thing to always describe the input output. So in one, sh in one view of the code, you can say, okay, this is an input, this is a wire and um, it's, it's a lot clearer to do it this way. Well, I think, um, and this is the same thing for the output, the output, you can either create them as a wire wires, simply a connection, or you can say, Hey, it's going to be a register. And which means that the output will be coming out of register instead of a combinatorial logic in a nutshell. 
Um, these are the amount of bits that you're gonna carry for that specific value. It's a vector. You decide, okay, that vector, that signal carry four signals with it. Uh, you can do it for outputs as well. So this is really how I do it. And that's why I'm making an accent on this because this is really, I don't see that way of doing things very often. I adopted that way because like I said, it's a lot easier, one read. I don't have to go back in the code and look it up and what is it? And it's when you're playing with other people's code, it tends to be very annoying. Um, and so basically module, name of the module, parentheses, you describe all your signals in and out of the modules, then closing parentheses, semicolon, I guess, whatever. Then you write all your codes. That way we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do next. And then at the end you say end module and you save your file. Um, so finally, the keywords wire reg assign. Assign is really a way to do combinatorial logic. I'll show you later. Always it's to create a, a block that will be driven by a clock or not, depending, but I'm not gonna touch the uh, blocking stuff today. I'm just gonna do non-blocking. Um, the if case, you'll see it resembles C very uh, closely. Uh, there's case that we use a lot because one thing, and I'm going to talk about this uh, right now, is the on concept of um, for people doing software, migrating to hardware, people have always a hard time because the concept is people need to understand is that everything happens at the same time. Every time the clock ticks, everything moves. It's not like a serial thing, one line after the other. Um, and so in order to make sense or to create events, we need to do a lot of state machines. And you do those cases, the state machines with case and end case, and we do them, all, well, I do them all the time. So this is important to craps or wraps your head around is the fact that every time, everything happens at the same time. Our every blocks or uh, always blocks will be activating something or doing something. They might be in one state and just being idle, but every clock cycle counts. That's why FPGs are so great because you can get, uh, can have many instances of the same thing in different state doing many things at the same time. So one interesting to know. So let's move on. So vectors always expressed by the biggest number first and then the zero later, or it can be a portion of like three and two and or three to zero, um, you take sections of the vectors. You can concatenate your different signals with different bits to come into one bus and to, you, you can define that bus and say, hey, so that helps create different organization or addition or multiplication or division. It's very easy to do it this way. Arrays, you can do arrays by saying, hey, I want a register. It's gonna be eight bit uh, containing bytes and the nomenclature for arrays is a bit different where you start with zero and then you say the numbers you want. In that case, you would have four register of eight bit. Probably not necessary today, but I thought I would mention it. So when you want to instantiate a modules within another modules, you literally say the name of the module and then you give a new name for the instance you want to create. And then you describe by a dot the name of the, the signals. In that case, I forgot to put the I. And then you create a new wire or the same name. You say a well, while clock, uh, clock signal, which is defined somewhere in the upper level of the Verilog uh, modules, because it's always one modules within another modules within the modules. And you can, I could instantiate many Stephanie modules by saying, mo saying module Stephanie zero, module Stephanie one, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you connect all these things together. So this is the overall, the module, the, the, the you know, stuff that we use mainly in Quartus. So what I'm gonna do now is just migrate to Quartus uh, setup, uh, all done. I'm going to uh, make this more important, uh, all done. There you go. I hope you see clearly, let's, okay, so, all right. So I'm going to, so do you see clearly or I need to make it bigger? I don't know if I'll be able to make it bigger at this point. Uh, that thing doesn't scale very well. Is it better now? No, probably not. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. I'm going to start, 
uh, a new project, oops, no, that's not what I wanted to do. So new project wizard, uh, it's not very easily scalable, although maybe I could scale the, uh, okay, let's see if this works better. Okay, if, okay, so you don't, okay, so unfortunately you don't see, let's see if you can, uh, you don't, do you see the wizard? Okay, I'm gonna switch back later. Okay, so this is the wizard, I'm sure you see clearly. Um, so with Quartus, uh, that's the Prime Light Edition 18.1. I'm going to go somewhere else. Uh, you know what? I'm going to stay there. I'm going to make it really simple. I'm going to call it VGA. The next step is to create an empty project. There's nothing to instantiate. I'm going to use a Max 10, which is really nice. Uh, I'm going to use a very small device, usually uh, the Max 10 is the FPGA that have the, um, the flash internally to program the device, which is really cool. Uh, I'm going to use a very small device, the cheapest device you can find. I'm going to use the 10M2002, which, is, which has 2,000 gates, which is more than we need. Um, this is typically uh, 144 pins. Um, so, you know, uh, like I said, I don't think we need to worry ourselves with the number of pins today. Uh, like I said, the, the, the basic here is really to create just the core. Um, so normally what I would do, so the system has created a project. Um, so the first thing I would do is to create a, uh, you go into, um, am I back into the thingy? Yes, I am. Okay, cool. So a new, um, a Verilog HDL file. So it creates uh, a .v file. So I'm going to put the microphone a little bit far away so I can see what I'm doing. So module, uh, we're gonna call it VGA. I'm gonna start opening. So first thing first, we know that I'm going to assume that the system has a reset input. So I would say uh, input, I'm gonna declare as a wire. So it's just a connectivity thingy. I'm gonna say reset and I'm gonna put underscore E to say that's an input. I'm going to assume that the system is going to provide me a clock, which is going to be the 25.125 megahertz on one clock pin somewhere. Um, then I'm going to say, uh, well, there's nothing much more that I can do than right now to say, I'm going to create a HSync out. I'm going to create an output uh, vsync out, oops, underscore out. Then I'm going to create, I could either create a, uh, H blanking out. Oh, you know what? We'll do it this way. So H blanking out. I'm going to create a V blanking out. And um, another, a name that is used a lot in with DAX and everything, it's DC for data, uh, data enable. And data enable is really the combination of the two blanking but if you would want to drive other part of the circuit with the blanking, um, this is something you'd like to, to have. The two separate signals can be very useful for other stuff later. Um, something else is also very useful is to get, and this is where I should have, I should have let a little bit more space. Um, so I want to get the pixel counter out for other modules to share because it's sometimes, it's useful to, um, so actually I could define it as a register in that case. So I'm gonna declare it as a register. So I'm declaring a register, it's gonna be 12 bit uh, register and we're gonna use it as a counter. So I'm gonna say pixel counter and I'm gonna describe it as an out. I'm gonna uh, do the same for uh, line counter, line count underscore O. And well, that's, that's it for us, I guess. Since we don't have a lot of time, I mean, we're not gonna do any memory interface, but like I said, that's a good start. Um, okay, let me see. Something I wanted to say is that we talked about the number of pixels during the line. 
So there's 100, 800 pixels. So to round up to two exponent something, so the, the, the closest is 21024. So that's probably why I have, I think it's nine bits, 10 bits. I'm gonna reduce it to nine. Uh, and we spoke about 512 lines, which is 525. So the closest is 1024. All right. So the first step is to, in order to create the, what we want is to create the counters. So we start with an always block, and this is the syntax. We're going to say that we want the block the always to react when the positive edge of the clock will come in. So we're going to use the clock input here. Okay. The way the Verilog stuff begin, it's not a, a accolades. It's a begin. It's always begin and end. You replace all the accolades with begin and end. Um, I'm going to implement a asynchronous reset because you could include into this parentheses other condition to be respected for the action of the always block to be executed. Um, a lot of people do synchronous um, reset, which means that you would do something like that. I do asynchronous stuff. I don't know why it's a habit. I, uh, no, the reset here, sorry. So you could do something like that and then the always will be executing. So in that case, um, so these are the signals that you want the always block to excavate. So there's other techniques, other ways to, to go about this, but this is very typical. So what I do is I say reset here. Whoops. All right, so reset. So I need my, my ASS. So begin and else begin. This is very typical to start an always block. This is, you get used to it. You say, okay, I'm gonna create the first counter. I'm gonna say pixel when we set, say that it's gonna be 10 bits. That's also a way I'm doing things. You don't have to put the separator, but I find it, you know, it's more clear. Um, so the, this is, non-blocking statement that says when you get a positive clock, when the clock is passed, the value will be stored in pixel. Good. Okay, thank you. So it's when you're doing, uh, it's called a, a blocking or non blocking. I, I always mix them both, but anyway, which means that every time when you use this, this, this way of expressing uh, the assignment, it's always happening one clock later. Okay, so if positive clock happens, it's going to be effective the next clock. Okay, so keep that in mind, it's very important. Um, so it's literally like a, a value will be transferred after the clock has passed. So you can assume that the clock that follows the value has been assigned. All right, so we, we have, so what we can do is say pixel clock, if pixel clock is smaller than, uh, let's say we're gonna do the 800. So we say the value D800, which means that we, uh, we have uh, posted the value 810 bits to make it equal with the pixel counter. If it's smaller, you say, I'm gonna put a big in here, and you're gonna say pixel count. Am I, can you hear me? Okay, uh, I can keep talking. I can do a song and dance if you want. So, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, okay, great, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, is it clear now? Uh, hold on, I'm going to, uh, there you go. Mm. Okay, well, cry every time that happens because I don't notice it. So you, you, you're my monitor. Okay, so to recap, so what I do here is I, 
the the always blocks every time there's a clock happening the the block gets executed okay uh, the reset is zero that means that i'm in this part of this if statement and if pixel count is smaller than 800 then i'm going to increment it by one okay so the counter is 10 bit wide i'm just going to get one plus one plus one plus one but if it gets to 799 which means that it gets to the point where the counter exceed the if statement i'm going to say Okay, reassign the counter back to zero. Okay, so this is as easy as it can get to create a counter with Verilog. It's very straightforward. And we're going to do the same thing for the line counter. So basically, this is the pixel counter. Okay, I'm going to separate the always block. You can have a thousand always block if you want. But in that case, what I'm going to do is use line counter, line counter, line counter, line counter. I'm sure, do you see it clearly? I hope you are. Uh, let me see if I can uh, go away. Uh, there you go. Okay, uh, so same thing, but we're gonna change the value here, 525. So, uh, I'm not sure if what I'm going to do is perfect and it's going to work, but it's a way of doing it. And there's always time afterward for people to try and to debug it. Um, I could put, so because right now we have created, actually I did something wrong uh, because now I'm assuming that every clock cycle, the line counter will increment, which is not true. In reality, I just, yeah, it's a big boo-boo. I just did that. Okay, so let's, let's fix that. You know, I just drank my own Kool-Aid. Uh, so what I'm going to do is bring this here, which means that every time, okay, uh, hold on, am I doing this right? Yes, okay. Uh, I'm gonna recap everything. So these are nestled I think this is the word to use uh, counters. So what I do is I count pixels to 800. And when I reach 800, I go back, I go into this section here of the bottom section of the if statement. Let's see if I didn't forget anything. Yes, I forgot here. Begin. Uh, and uh, this is the begin. This is, I think it's okay now. Okay. so. Um, I'm going to put back, I'm going to reset the pixel count back to zero, but then I'm going to increment line count by one till I reach the, the count of 525. And then I'm going to go back to zero and the, the whole thing start over again. So nestled, you know, counters to counters, but one is predicated on the uh, ending results or reaching the value of the first one and so on and so forth. That should work. Now, what we have to do is, first of all, we need to create the condition or we need to generate the H sig signal. By the way, depending on the, res the resolution you're using, if you want to go faster, there's the polarity of the sync that changes. So something you can invert later, but I'm just letting you know that vertical sync and horizontal syncs for monitors are not always activated by uh, one value or you know high value or something. So what we want to do is say, hey, I want to create the H sync. What I'm going to do is say, I want to create an H sync every time the pixel counter is, um, so this is really combinatorial logic. And uh, what we would do is say pixel logic is equal to, or like an if statement. So pixel counter will be, I don't remember the value. Can somebody remember, tell me the values? Okay, it was like, uh, uh, okay, hold on. I'm gonna go back to check my pixel, my, my, uh, my information here my presentation okay so i said uh, okay 160 160 and it lasts uh, 15 no 15 to 112 okay so bigger than 15 so 10 d 15 so this is the first condition and you want it end like any if statement in 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 c 
and you say smaller than I said 112. So 10 bit wide count, uh, value with the value 112. And you can put parentheses here to complete everything just for the sake of better understanding. And you use a interrogation mark. It's like a if, um, do you have that in C? I think you do. And you say, you could leave it that way, but for clarity, what I usually do, I employ, I write down also the values of what it should be. So when this is true, this value is, is assigned to H sync. And when this is not true, this is the value that is assigned to H sync. But normally, since it's, a, it's like a, a condition, it's implied that if this is true, H sync would be one. And if it's not, then it would be zero. But like I said, I tend to use, I put everything for clarity because your brain doesn't have to think. Your brain is already busy doing something else. So you don't want to bother yourself with that kind of stuff. So uh, H sync. So basically all the signals are creating the same way. I just use the line counter and the line counter here. And um, I go back to my value, it's supposed to be nine and uh, 13. So VSync will be created when line counter is bigger than 10, bigger than nine and smaller than 12. And like I said, when this is true, VSync will be one and um, HSync will be zero. So the blanking, same thing. I'm gonna do a copy and paste, I'm gonna, just move that up for you people. Uh, blanking, same thing. Uh, v blanking, same thing. You assign. And um, the values for this is um, in that case, pixel count should be minus 160. And we're in, you can do sign and unsigned stuff. It's assumed that if you don't specify it, it's going to be unsigned. So, and uh, sign stuff with Verilog is a bit tricky, but just to let you know, uh, be careful when you're doing uh, signed stuff with Verilog. And the other one is uh, minus 45. So minus 45. Okay, I wanna move my ASS quickly. I'm running out of time. So 45, same thing. And ultimately, the, D, the, the signal D with zero here would be a combination of both. So it's or H blanking or, so if you would use, um, there's this uh, analog devices, part ADV 71 something, uh, they use the, all the, the all these, uh, you know, if you wanted to use, uh, like you wanted to do uh, TMDS stuff like uh, VGA with uh, BVI, or HDMI, uh, those uh, converting controller or these uh, VDAC or whatever, they use this signaling. So HSync, VSync, and DE. And DE is basically to tell it when the, the pixel data is, is valid. So you create these two signals and we're done. So normally uh, I would store it like, well, I'm gonna store it there, I guess, I suppose. And uh, normally you would, um, to finish this, you go in file because you created a file. Uh, I think it, it okay, automatically, when you, you say new Verilog file, it assigns automatically the, the file to your project. And normally I could uh, click compile. It's going to, on its own, assign the pins. And there's ways to, uh, oops, something is wrong. Uh, there's a way to force the pin to tell it to, um, there's an end some, somewhere missing, mm, probably somewhere here. So in NF is and else, uh, so one big and big and uh, anyway, I don't want to waste too much time because I'm running out of time, but so there's like an end missing somewhere where I put an extra one, which should not be there. So for people who want to do FPGAs, super important. Uh, the best strategy to create a big circuitry and everything is usually to, to do your circuitry before you do your PCB. You compile your design 
when you're sure that pretty you're pretty much there, but most people just do half of it. They do their PCB and they finish it later. But it's always a good way. It's always a good thing to uh, let the, the tools assign the pins for better connectivity and fastest delay and for, for things to go as fast as possible. And then you lock your pins and then you do your PCB. But sometimes the whole, the, the signals are all over the place and it just makes your PCB design really crappy. So usually you're going to do the other way around, which is to assign to tell the FPGA, hey, my, my pins will be there because it makes my routing easier. So this is in a nutshell what you would do to just create the signals. I want to go back for the last part um, of the presentation where I'm going to show you uh, in terms of block diagram, uh, how you would go about, oops, that's not what I want to do, uh, say yeah. Okay, so moving on. So you see my, uh, let's, okay. So my couple of slides left I wanted to present you is how you would go about um, implementing this into, um, so I'll try to make it as big as I can. So there's the block we just uh, created. So let's zoom in here. So there's the generator that we have just created. We have all the counter that we needed. Few things, okay, this is the text. I'm gonna go back to the bitmap. So normally with a bitmap, it's very simple. You use your pixel count to drive the memory, okay? Which means that every time the pixel goes from zero or you, 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 the way you do it or the way you can do it is really to just use the pixel line. If you have a lot of memory, just assign the pixel count to the address to the memory. And also you add a circuitry to move your pointer to a new place in the memory every time you want to start a new line. So basically you're gonna, you could use the line count multiplied by the, uh, the number, like for example, let's say you want to display 640 pixels, but in your memory, you want those, every line to be contiguous one after the other, you use the line counter, you create a, a small circuitry in Verilog and you just, uh, it's a multiplier. You say line count multiplied by the uh, 640, and it gives you an address, and you would add it with the pixel count. So every time you pixel count to 0 to 100, to 800, or 640 in that case, you would just, um, you know, add the multiplication with the addition with the pixel count, and then the pointer would move to one, one memory location to the other. Something you need to keep in mind uh, so usually the memory that you need is very big. So you would need to drive an external SRAM, for example. Um, and then depending on the, the color depth, then you put more data. Um, so you could have like a 32 bit and have a RGB. Something you need to keep in mind is that the memory always take a certain time to get the data out. So usually one clock. So you need to delay everything by one clock. So everything happens at the right time here at the DAC. So everything, otherwise everything will be off. So the binary implementation or the bitmap implementation is very easy because it's straight up just a counter driving a memory, whatever comes out, you get out on the DAC side, could be a uh, one byte. And then you could put another memory block which would be a lookup table. And from that lookup table, you could get a 24 bit output from the 256 value coming out of the main memory. It's really up to you at this point. The second implementation is the character set. Uh, let me zoom out. So same block that we created today. Um, and then it's a bit more, it's interesting because it's definitely more complex because you need first the memory to store your characters. So the ASCII you would want, oops, sorry. The characters, so the text memory that you could also combine with a color memory, which is like a little bit like the Commodore 64, I suppose. Um, so a separate part of the memory, which for the same uh, location, but a different, I mean, in the memory, there are different two banks, separate banks, but with the same offset, you could have one character information, which means the ASCII character and one byte that goes along. That's for example, that's what I did in the Phoenix. There's four bits for the foreground, four bits in the background. What you do is then you, that character drives and drives the character ROM, which could be inside the FPGA that you assign a file to a RAM block and you say, this is my ROM, my ROM character ROM. And the first three lines will drive the 
level, the, the line of the character you need. So if you have the ASCII character A, you need to scan between which line you want of the character A, depending on where you are in the display. So obviously if you're line zero to eight, then you need to have uh, the first, the right line for the, the right line you want to display, right? Makes sense. Then the second part needs to be driven by the choice of the character you want. So if the, the character said ASCII 41, then you need to go get the data for the character that is the 40, 41st character. 40, yeah, that's it. And then through the 41st character, you scan the eight lines of the character. And within that character, there's the eight bit. And then you, depending on where you are on the line count, the pixel count. So every, this is the easiest way to do it anyway, because when you're starting to do nine and 16 and all these things, not anything that is not a two square or exponent something, you can use the pixel count, which is zero to eight. And then you pick the, I said pixel shift, but in reality you choose the bit you want. So you want to display the first most left bit first, and then you move on to the second one. And so that bit value tells you, is it a background pixel or it's a foreground pixel? So basically is it, are we displaying a pixel from the letter A or not? And then can control, sorry again, control the um, switch here that decide is it the foreground color I want or the background color? And then you have these value can be RGBA and then you go out to your VDAC. That circuitry takes a little bit more time. So you need to delay those H sync, D sync and D accordingly for the DDAC. So ultimately when the, 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 the first pixel comes after the blanking is, is, is over with, you need to, everything needs to be perfectly synchronized perfectly for it to be seen. Mostly the DE signals is the most important. Uh, if the H-sync and V-syncs are offset, sometimes it's okay. Uh, monitors are not that very picky about this. So that's that's basically it. So I'm two minutes away from being done. But yeah, that's overall how you go about creating a VGA or any other resolution, just changing the size of the counter and um, depending on the pixels, the line, and so on and so forth, and the polarity of this, the each thing and the VSync. So that's it for me. Uh, do you have any, do we have any question at this point? As you write the Verilog code. Mm -hmm. How do you iterate over verifying it's correct? Uh, okay, so basically verify it's correct. So it's it's like a school of thought. Uh, it's there. There's this idea that you know you can hold on. I've lost my screen. Anyway, um, okay. So normally with Verilog, you can. There's a way to simulate this, the the circuitry. You can create the test vectors. So, which is another, it's a Verilog file with extra instructions to create, you know, signals, stimuli on different inputs and outputs. And part of the software allows you to see what's coming out. Um, functionally, it's something that is, can be very helpful. Uh, I think the strategy is usually, if you're a good soldier and you want to do these things right, uh, you usually just going to spend a lot of time creating all these uh, stimuli and test file. And you're going to test it on your, you can test it on modules, you can test it on the overall projects. But when you start dealing with bigger blocks like DRAM controller, big controllers and stuff like that, makes it becomes very difficult, it takes a long time for simulation to happen. Um, honestly, I, for one, I'm not a, a simulation person. I hate it. It takes a long time. So a lot of overhead, I'm more a practical person. So I would literally compile it and put it in the circuitry and make it work. And then when I'm starting to have uh, early on, uh, when the FPG is very empty, you, you met your timings really quickly, unless you do it in like really fast high speed stuff, you don't have to worry about anything. You just put it in there. You make sure that your pin are dry, you're, you're assigned the right pins, the, the, the right signals are driving the right pins and you start debugging it live. Uh, you can also use a block that you can instantiate within Quartus that is called a chip. Well, I call it a chip scope. It's called ILA in, um, 
in Quartus, it's a block that simulate a, a chip scope like a, a logic analyzer. Well, that's why they call it ILE, I suppose. Intel logic analyzer, whatever. Uh, and so what I do is I, inst I call it a chip scope because Intel calls it a chip. Anyway, instantiate it. You say how many inputs you have, and then you have an under application you connect to the JTAG that allows you to monitor what's going on. That's how I go about it. I use all the internal JTAG accessible tools that allows me to probe the circuitry inside the FPGA uh, through the chip scope circuitry and everything. I'm not a simulation person. Some people love it. I hate it. It's a lot of time. So that's how you go about testing it. But you get used to your thing and you realize that when things are not working right with the chip scope and everything, you, you figure out your problem very quickly. And then uh, things get more tricky when you're, you have timing issues and everything where you start analyzing, but usually instability. But this is another for another class, another day. Does that answer the question? Anything else? Oh, every time you compile, like for example, we have 2000 gates. Well, I'm, gone, I'm calling them gates, but it's LE logical element. But anyway, if it's always been this thing with Xilinx and Intel, it's never been really precise. But anyway, to answer the question is that at the end of the compile, there's always a statistic page at the end. So it tells you how many resources you've used, how many block RAM you've used, how many PLL you've used in the device. I mean, everything, it tells you everything. You have a summary at, at, the, at the end, so it creates a page with summary. And there's all their documents that gives you all the rundowns of what happened and what they're using and when and how. So it's pretty precise. But you know, if you manage to get your part full, by the way, a, a good rule of thumb for anybody using doing FPGA design, don't exceed like 70, 80%. Anyway, if you go higher than that of utilization, you start having a lot of issues and timing and stuff like this, it takes a long time. So it's, it's one of those things that you can never reach 100% of usage, but yeah. So take a bigger part, make your life easy. Does that answer the question? It's a great question, <laughs> none. You know, the Cyclone 10 is in reality a Cyclone 4 with a smaller geometry of fabrication. There's nothing new under the sun. The Cyclone 10 didn't introduce anything new. I mean, they changed a, a couple of names for certain blocks, but I, I it's the it's same thing. I, I got the same, actually this week I was debugging stuff and I, I compiled both and I end up having the same exact results. So, there was no difficulty at all. Even the parts have the same pin out aside of two, three pins that are different. It's the same. And that's, that's funny because I realized that three months later that the, the pin out of the packages for the Cyclone 10 that I was using, which is a 40,000 gates was exactly this, almost the same. Three pins are different. So Cyclone 10 is really a respin of the Cyclone 4 and probably like, uh, I don't know, 180 nanometer process instead of being 250 nanometer process or something like this. So none. I wish it would have been easier, but uh, more difficult, but no. No? Are, are they happy? Did they learn something? <laughs> So ask people again, who is going to start doing FPG design now? <laughs> nice, okay, great. After that, you'll have to find the parts. <laughs> well, buy an eval, eval board, they already been made, so they're easy to find. 
All right. I'm glad if I got a, a, a bunch of new uh, disciple in the group of FPGA designers. Yep. No, Sunday, Sunday, yes, the big reveal and uh, yes, thank you. Well, the next talk will be two parts. The next talk will be a bit of a repeat what I did at VCS West, which is really the process of designing a product from scratch and the hurdle and the pain and suffering that we once needs to endure to actually make it happen, which is part of my suffering. So I'm sharing the suffering because I figured out over the years that some people kind of this the uh, brush off the idea, oh, it's easy to make uh, and they complain and I'm trying to share the pain with everybody. But also it's, uh, it's gonna be the moment I'm going to unveil uh, because I've been designing this uh, keyboard version of the Phoenix with a 68040, the A2560K, and I'm finally going to be unveiling to the, the world, and it's going to start, I'm going to do it uh, at, this, uh, at this moment, at the end of the presentation. So that's why I'm really grateful that you gave me like 30 more minutes, um, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about and show. And uh, I'm, I'm really thankful. Thank you very much to everybody for assisting. I really appreciate it. And Jeffrey, I'll see you on Sunday.